start then. Hello everyone, and welcome to the second webinar of the webinar of the eCoach webinar chain. Uh, the first one in 2021 is for us a special year because this year, as you all know, is the 20th anniversary of the 2001 Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. And we have an agenda that is very, very busy during the whole year. As you saw, there are different uh, speakers, uh, members of iCoach that will be uh, speaking to all of us during the whole year, every year, every month we have uh, some speakers talking. In February we will have uh, Marc-André Vernier talking about uh, the Arctic, but today we have two of the most important speakers that we have that will inaugurate this year, and without further ado we will uh, start uh, with the webinar of today. So the first speaker of today is Dr. Lucy Siman. She's gonna talk about maritime archeology in Lebanon and the recent, recent initiatives by the Honor Trust Foundation in the country. Lucy Siman is the Honor Trust Foundation maritime archeologist in Lebanon since 2019. She's been involved in archeology span since 96 and he has participated and directed many different international maritime and terrestrial archeological surveys, uh, geophysical surveys, et cetera, et cetera, in Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Cyprus, and Saudi Arabia. She also taught and lectured in maritime archaeology in Lebanon and abroad. She holds a bachelor degree in arts and archaeology from the Lebanese University, a master's degree in maritime archaeology from the University of Southampton, and a PhD in Arab and Islamic studies with a focus on maritime archaeology from the University of Exeter. From 2016 and 2018, Lucy was awarded the three-year Honor First Foundation from the postdoc fellowship at the University of Balaman, Lebanon. So, Lucy, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. All right. Sorry, I had a power cut. So everyone can see the screen, yeah? Yes, Lucy, we can see it. Yeah, brilliant. Huh, except me. Hang on. You have a problem? Yeah. I'll restart my um, my presentation. Hang on. And you know, in Lebanon at 6 p.m. sharp, uh, we've got a um, power cut. I don't know if Martin uh, has it or... <laughs> <laughs> if uh, any of the other Lebanese attendees uh, experience that. Okay. Hi, hi, Lucy. Hi, I was cut as hi. well. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to hear you. So nicely. Okay. Many Lebanese suffer then. Brilliant. So we will do your presentation then. And because of the power cut, maybe we leave some five minutes after your presentation for questions then. All right. Okay. So uh, all is good now. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me this evening, part of this uh, webinar series. I would like to thank Ikush and also um, the Honor Frost Foundation, of course, for supporting a large part of academic and capacity building initiatives um, in Lebanon. So tonight I'm going to start, um, I uh, gave a bit uh, certain aspects of the, this talk uh, uh, yesterday in the NAES uh, webinar. So if any of you attended yesterday, uh, you might find this uh, today a bit repetitive, but the focus will be more on the on our Frost Foundation initiatives um, in the country. So uh, what we're going to look at this evening together is just a, you know, a rapid introduction of the geographical context of the country, the historical background, as well as um, uh, the nature of the resource and how this resource, the maritime archaeological resource, was uh, studied through um, the year. So we're going to have a uh, look at the diachronic uh, development of the discipline in, in Lebanon. There's a lot to say, so uh, I will try to condense a uh, very wide uh, subject um, in the short time that we, we have. So uh, this is roughly uh, where Lebanon uh, is in the Eastern Mediterranean, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with, with the area. Okay, um, so Lebanon is largely, the terrain is, is uh, uh, slightly rectangular. Sorry, I think we don't see your screen. Well, 
I don't know if it's my, my problem only, but I don't know if you shared the screen. Uh, yes, I don't have to see, uh, I don't seem to have a problem on my side. Everybody's seeing her screen? No, no, I no we, don't, we don't see you. We don't, we, see, we you. don't see the screen. No? No, can you try to reach, reshare the screen? Okay. Now, it seems. How okay. about now? Now it's working. Yeah. Okay, so in the previous uh, slide, and it seems that the connection is really slow today. Yesterday it was functioning much better. So in the previous slide, I was just showing the Google Maps uh, for those of you who um, need a bit of geographical references. Uh, reference. So we're talking about Lebanon, which is in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean basin. And uh, roughly it's a rectangular uh, terrain. So it shrinks from North uh, to the South. And it's made uh, of um, a set of four physiogeographic uh, areas. So you've got uh, that run parallel uh, to the Mediterranean Sea. You've got the coast, which is very, very narrow uh, and followed by the uh, Western uh, mountain chain of uh, Mount Lebanon. Uh, um, then uh, the Beka Valley, which is the uh, central plateau and then the anti-Lebanon, which uh, separates uh, Lebanon from Syria to the east. The continental shelf of Lebanon, so going westwards now towards the Mediterranean Sea, the continental shelf of Lebanon also reflects the um, terrestrial uh, topography because it is also wider to the north and it shrinks a bit to the south and it drops uh, quite dramatically um, at uh, a depth of uh, 1,000 to 1,200 uh, meters of depth. And this bathymetry map was provided by the CNRS of Lebanon. Uh, the country is very much um, located in a seismic area. So there's a lot of vertical movements due to the tectonic activity. And this has caused, uh, as you might you know, uh, imagine, a lot of um, vertical displacement and a lot of um, influence on the uh, presence of the archaeological features on the, on the coast. It is also a country that is very rich in water. We've got uh, more than 15 uh, rivers running throughout the country. These rivers do not have floodplains, so they run uh, directly in uh, deeply encased valleys and they transport a lot of sediment along the way. These kind of, this sediment accumulation, you can imagine that it influences coastal sites where the uh, coast is quite low lying. Uh, you've got examples here of Al, um, Almina in Tripoli in North Lebanon. You've got the examples of uh, Sidon with its uh, uh, ridge uh, and its uh, northern and southern bays. And you've got the example, of course, of Tyre, which is also located in South Lebanon. Um, these examples are quite indicative of what is happening mostly of the of the landscape as it were if you would come and visit lebanon this is what you would see uh, in terms of the maritime landscape so you've got these uh, headlands that protect uh, bays uh, north and uh, south of uh, of them so you know according to where the wind is blowing uh, from you've got uh, uh, protected uh, bays Okay, right. Everyone is seeing the screen, yeah, so far? Yes, affirmative. Okay, brilliant. So um, Lebanon has, uh, of course, uh, this richness in, in natural resources, the closest, closeness to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the richness in, in water and so on. Uh, eventually, um, encouraged uh, the development of the different uh, occupation and settlements. And Lebanon has been occupied about uh, 1 million years ago, as is testified by this uh, map. 
uh, and by over 400 prehistoric sites, most of which, as you can see on the map, uh, are located at the coast, and uh, some of which have um, yielded um, artifacts such as uh, fish hooks and uh, uh, fish bones and so on, which, you know, demonstrates this uh, connection uh, with the sea. So the Lebanese uh, coast so far has, in some of the places, especially in Biblos, for example, has been um, uh, has been uh, occupied for uh, over, over millennia, really. And so it presents, uh, even though it's only uh, on, a, on a narrow territory, uh, Lebanon uh, coast is only 220 kilometers. So uh, within this modest uh, coast, you've got a well uh, rich uh, maritime archeological record uh, compared to, uh, to other countries in the Mediterranean. Now, what is the nature of this resource? Uh, you've got coastal sites uh, with unexplored maritime underwater cultural uh, heritage potential. The reason why I divided this this way is just to be able to convey to you the idea that um, there are coastal sites uh, that, were, that were excavated on land first, and not all of these uh, sites um, if you want to have a, uh, a study of the, have had the study of the, their waters, their adjacent uh, waters. So uh, there are a lot of coastal sites that still need to be um, scientifically explored and studied. Uh, you've got um, archaeology that is lying underneath the uh, urban uh, mesh of certain uh, sites on the coast such as in Beirut uh, and so on, uh, in Tyre, in Sidon, um, et cetera. You've got, of course, harbor structures, the one in, in, uh, in Biblos, in Tyre, in Sidon, just to name, uh, to name a few. Uh, there is a, a, a presence of shipwrecks that, that have been reported um, and that have been explored as well. Um, there, there are a few studies on maritime quarry sites, uh, such as in Biblos and in Anfe, um, and in Tripoli, um, and uh, the river mouse also uh, presents a, a wide potential for, uh, for archaeological, uh, of archaeological significance, that is. So now that we um, have an overview of the archaeological resource. So what kind of, um, let's discuss the, the early scholarly interest in the maritime archaeology in this archaeological uh, record. And we go back to the uh, 17th century when um, Lebanon was under Ottoman rule. However, French, um, French and European scholars uh, were um, exercising a bit of soft politics, as it were, in the country uh, by um, having ties uh, mainly with the Maronite uh, community of, of Lebanon. And um, this travel literature is very important because um, several travelers uh, describe uh, certain sites and certain um, aspects of the archaeology that uh, nowadays is completely gone. So although many of these people, and I've listed a few here, Mondrel, Pocot, Cronin, and uh, Guérin, but of course there are uh, plenty more, um, you, have, you, uh, you have to know that this kind of literature is also uh, a bit lacking uh, information on underwater cultural heritage, evidently because at the time these people were not um, uh, divers. Uh, however, uh, I must um, note that uh, Renan, among all uh, these people, was the, the perhaps uh, the only one who spoke about sea level changes, about uh, the in, uh, about the erosion, the effects of erosion uh, on the of the sea on coastal sites. Um, he described uh, several sites on the coast in Lebanon, but also in the mountains. And 
uh, again, uh, uh, this travel literature of these scholars is quite important because it denotes the situation of the coastal heritage, at least um, at that time. Now, the early development really of underwater archaeology started with Antoine Poitbar, uh, who initiated uh, research in the country, of course, aided by the Aviation Française du, du Levant. At the time, Lebanon uh, was uh, under the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon. And these French uh, cultural ties were reinforced. There was the creation of the Service des Antiquités by uh, General Gouraud. And um, so with this, again, uh, soft uh, politics uh, angle, as it were, Antoine Poitbar uh, applied aer aerial photography to the study of harbors in Lebanon, such as uh, the aerial view that you see here of uh, the site of Biblos. Uh, here you can see uh, in North Lebanon, that is. Uh, here you can see the site of Sidon with its islet, uh, the Ziri islet, that had been suggested already by Ernest Renan as being used uh, as an offshore um, uh, stopover for, for as an uh, outer harbor um, of, of Sidon uh, located to the north of, uh, of the site. Uh, Poitbar notably as well studied uh, uh, and published uh, a lot about Tyre. And what is special about uh, his publication in Tyre is that he was able to chart uh, submerged um, uh, submerged um, ar uh, uh, archaeological remains because he used French divers, but also he relied on local divers, local sponge divers, that since he was not a diver himself. So he was, um, so he was using this type of information, the second hand information, one must say, uh, to document uh, submerged uh, features uh, along the Lebanese coast. And it's really uh, with uh, Honor Frost, uh, since the pioneer of maritime archaeology in Lebanon, uh, she first came to the country in the 50s, at the end of the 50s, and she dived not only the star sites such as uh, Biblos, Sidon, and Tyre, but also uh, back then, less known localities uh, around uh, the, um, the coastal strip of, of the country. As most of you know, her main interest was uh, harbors, the harbors of Lebanon. Uh, here you have the um, recording that she did of Ras Biblos. This is the Tel. Uh, this is the medieval harbor. Uh, so she recorded uh, these uh, features and many other features as well. Uh, her main interest also was, was the anchors. And uh, she published uh, her main findings in under the Mediterranean, but also in several other um, articles. Now, uh, her work had to be uh, stopped uh, because of the uh, civil war, really. But after the civil war, she returned to Lebanon and initiated a whole set of uh, new research that we will see later on. During the civil war, since that, that happened uh, between 1975 and 1990, the uh, all foreign missions in Lebanon were halted. And it's only with local initiatives that uh, underwater archaeology uh, was a bit, uh, research in underwater archaeology was a bit pursued. So um, with uh, Zaria Amadouni, uh, who published several books, among which is the book uh, Plongée archéologique sur le littoral libanais in French. Um, he was not, uh, he's not an archaeologist himself, but he is uh, uh, the f one of, um, among the first uh, divers, uh, diving instructors in, in Lebanon. Uh, he documented the underwater uh, cultural heritage at, at the, in North Lebanon mainly, uh, in, uh, at Tripoli, Kalamoun, Anfe, um, Heri and uh, Biblos. 
so in and in some uh, places such as Tripoli, for example, as you can see to your right hand side of the of the slide. Um, uh, no other work was done since then. So here is again the uh, merit of uh, of uh, Amadouni's uh, contribution to underwater archaeology. Post war. Um, Honor Frost returned to the country, and there was a bit of, with her, a bit of revival of uh, underwater archaeology in Lebanon, mainly through uh, several geomorphological campaigns that happened uh, in Biblos, in Tyre, and in, in Sidon, uh, where uh, scholars attempted along collaborations between foreign and local scholars, collaborate, uh, sorry, aimed at defining uh, the limits of uh, ancient harbor basins, as well as uh, the other type of studies that happened back then is the urban excavations that happened during the early 90s in the uh, Beirut Central District. Uh, probably some of you know that Beirut was completely destroyed during the Civil War. So, after the civil war, there was a, um, a large uh, archaeological, uh, probably the largest uh, that happened in the Middle East, uh, urban in an urban setting, and a few maritime in, uh, installations such as this uh, Hellenistic and Persian key uh, was unearthed uh, under the um, urban uh, layer in, in Beirut. And uh, other, uh, a third example of, uh, of research in underwater archaeology uh, back then, uh, as you can see in the, uh, these uh, slide, uh, sorry, these photos to the right of the slide, uh, you've, you've got underwater um, survey that happened uh, com while complementing work, terrestrial work, so work on land. Um, this is the example of Tal Fadous in North Lebanon. Uh, this is the example of Tyre and its uh, so-called uh, Southern Harbor, which was thought to be the Southern Harbor, but then Honor Frost proved that it was not. Uh, remember, because she was she was able to uh, observe uh, these structures firsthand while Antoine Poitbar and the others before him just relied on secondhand information. Um, re more recently, uh, in the past uh, decade or so, uh, uh, underwater archaeology really gained momentum in, um, during that time. Uh, with uh, work that varied between excavations, uh, either underwater or uh, on land, uh, as well as geophysical uh, uh, surveying. And uh, these were mainly um, when the, uh, uh, these projects took place, when the Honor Frost Foundation was uh, established in 2011, and it opened its first, its first round of grants in 2013. Um, now, the, I'm not going to go through this uh, whole list, but please, you can uh, make sure to have a look at these uh, projects uh, for the past two decades uh, at uh, our at the link here below. Um, so, at uh, the Honor Frost Foundation uh, page. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Honor Frost Foundation, it's a UK registered uh, charity. And when Honor, uh, uh, when Honor Frost died in 2010, she left the bulk of her estate to establish uh, this foundation in order to promote maritime archeology, span uh, specifically in the Eastern Mediterranean. So this uh, foundation is led by a board of uh, six trustees and uh, a UK-based uh, staff. And the main goal um, of uh, the Honor Frost Foundation is to encourage research, education and training, capacity and resource building, management and production, uh, protection of the resource, disseminating and publishing uh, studies and overall developing the discipline 
And these uh, are done through either small grants or uh, large grants, and you can visit the website for, for more details. So in, term of, in terms of research, uh, the nature of the research is either uh, targeting coastal survey and excavations, underwater surveys and excavations, and anything that can uh, develop the discipline and employ new technologies in underwater archaeology, and overall uh, arriving to the development uh, of the discipline that has more and more gained this momentum and gain uh, and, and became uh, more inclusive of this idea of the seamlessness between land and sea. And uh, the Honor Frost Foundation as well encourages a lot of uh, local, uh, local students to do their masters and their PhDs abroad because so far we don't have such um, programs in Lebanon. Um, it also uh, offers bursaries uh, to attend international meetings and conferences uh, and workshops abroad. Um, locally, uh, it has supported a lecture tour that uh, I had the chance to participate in with Dr. Lucy Blue, to whom um, um, I, I express my deep gratitude uh, for being really the, uh, the force behind uh, everything we do. Uh, I was able to uh, go at uh, Alexandra University. Thank you, Imad, uh, for having me. Uh, it was one of the best experiences really teaching at the University of Alexandria. And since last year, uh, HFF supported a minor course in marine sciences and culture. So far, uh, it is, this minor is open to AUB uh, scholars, uh, students. Um, uh, they can register for it either as an elective or as a, as a minor uh, per se. But also the Honor Frost Foundation uh, has supported uh, so far six uh, scholarships in total for students from the Lebanese University uh, which is a pub the public university in Lebanon, in order to attend uh, this course at AUB, which you know is a private university. So, for those of them who cannot afford uh, the the fees, in terms of capacity building, the HFF uh, supported uh, the attendance of two Lebanese conservators in the workshop that happened in uh, Cyprus along with uh, uh, our Cypriot colleagues. Um, it supports archaeologists uh, and students of archaeology who would like to um, get a more hands-on experience in, wonder, uh, in underwater archaeology. So it supports them uh, in their diving uh, training. So we train uh, students and uh, early career researchers also as part of uh, running projects uh, from the long list that I had showed you earlier. Uh, it, the HFF also encourages field schools in maritime archaeology and ethnography, and it has uh, funded a desk-based assessment of the maritime archaeological resource in, in Lebanon, which I had worked on uh, back in 2015. Um, in addition to all uh, these activities that the HFF is undertaking in Lebanon, uh, it has set a rescue uh, archaeology response team at the request of the General Directorate of Antiquities. Um, so uh, in, back in 2018, and uh, we did a lot of uh, surveys and salvation surveys uh, throughout the country, both in North and um, South Lebanon. The HFF also collaborated uh, with the Yamina project and the Marea project um, and we took the participants uh, here to Batroun, a, a site in, in North uh, Lebanon. As I mentioned, the HFF uh, and, uh, supported this uh, capacity building um, uh, initiative uh, when uh, Dr. Uh, Julian Janssen van Rensburg led a, an ethnographic uh, field school 
that aimed at recording the tangible and intangible uh, maritime heritage of, of the village of Enfi. So um, students were able to speak with uh, the community of fishermen and learn about the tradition. Uh, and they were able to learn how to record anchors and uh, traditional fishing boats and so on. Um, with the collaboration of uh, NES, uh, we, uh, we uh, organized uh, two uh, field uh, schools where uh, archaeology students were able to learn the basics of underwater archaeological recording and surveying. And some of the students, the ones that did not know how to dive, they also got an additional grant to learn how to dive beforehand. And last the last but not least, um, the HFF um, encouraged and supported uh, the production of two documentaries about maritime archaeology and underwater archaeology. Uh, these are the Anne Lemreci Research Project and the Enfe Research Project. And you can have a look at these short educational documentaries at the links that I have provided here in the slide. So hopefully with all these capacity building initiatives, we can better preserve uh, our uh, underwater cultural heritage and better manage it uh, for the future. Uh, before I leave you, I would like to um, uh, just present a quick uh, slide about uh, the bibliography of most of the sites that I had included in the slide, but also on the development of the discipline. And I hope you find these very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. I think we all are astonished by, uh, by the work that you and the Honor Frost Foundation have been doing. Not only Honor Frost itself, herself on, was alive in order to develop underwater archaeology in, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in other parts uh, in the Mediterranean too, uh, but also, I mean, after with the foundations, I mean, uh, how all these activities that the foundation is encouraging uh, are developing not only capacities, but also research and also changing the mindset of governments in order to apply uh, best standards. So thank you very much for, for, for your presentation. It's been fantastic. Uh, I remind all the viewers that uh, you can make all the questions you want in the chat. Uh, maybe we can have uh, one space for one question now. Uh, I mean, they, they're asking if the slides will be shared somewhere. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, uh, probably I mean, we can send it over. You have one question now, please put it forward. Otherwise, we move forward to the next presentation uh, because, I mean, I think we have to finish the whole session by uh, in the next 30 minutes. So please put your questions on, on the chat and I will be keeping an eye on them so we can have some five, 10 minutes later to reply to all questions. Thank you, Lucy. So you now so we much. pass to the next uh, ex speaker, the speaker, Dr. Hakan Donis. He's associate professor from the Academic University in Antalya. He graduated in the Department of Art History and Archaeology at the Eastern Mediterranean University and did his master and PhD in underwater archaeology at Selçuk University of Konya in Turkey. He's one of the founders and one of the first and the first coordinator of the UNESCO Unitwin Underwater Archaeology Network. He was a uh, coordinator between 2012 and 2015. Among many other things, he's the head of the Mediterranean and the Water Cultural Heritage Division at the Mediterranean Civilizations Research Institute in Adenis University. He is also head of the Department of Restoration and Conservation of Cultural Heritage at the Faculty of Arts and also director of Underwater Archaeology Research Center at the same university. He has been managing many different underwater archaeology research projects and he is currently the secretary of the Comos ICUC Committee. At the same time, he's a specialist member of ICOMOS Turkey, the National Committee of Underwater Cultural Heritage, member of UNESCO National Observation Committee for Underwater Archaeology, a member of SIMA Scientific Committee. Hakan, welcome. Thank you very much for being today with us. He is going to be speaking about how do we preserve underwater cultural heritage in touristic regions. The screen is yours, Hakan. Thank you very much, um, Arturo. It is a very nice beginning. Actually, I have an objection to the secretary of IQUC and also the moderator of the program. Why? Because I'm talking just after a beautiful girl who speaks very nice, very English and a very nice francophone and 
having some words after her will be very difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> you will do fine. Just speak slowly, and I'm sure you will do fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, yes, you see, your presentation was very nice, and we have learned many uh, important things. Okay, uh, my presentation is on how do we preserve an underwater cultural heritage in touristical regions. This subject is also part of my um, article in our new book. As you know, I could has a new book now uh, named uh, Protection of Underwater Heritage. Okay, a very short text that I'm also going to read it. Major part of modern life has become increasingly twined with the sea, but this greater connectivity has become a source of wide variety of problems that are having an important impact on it, included the culture. This problem and cultural heritage uh, in numerous ways, either directly or indirectly. These effects are more obvious in touristic size and their environs built on the shores of oceans, seas, lakes, and rivers. By the way, do you see my presentation? Yes, we see it. We see it. Okay, perfect. As a result of tourism and population growth, expanding city infrastructure and associated industrialization has created factors that put more pressure on the ocean lakes and rivers. As a consequence of this pressure, described that many archaeological remains lying under, under coastal waters or on shores are now gone virtually. Okay, I'm giving some um, example from the coast of Turkey, because as you know, uh, this coastline is about 1000 kilometers coastline and uh, are under of our responsibility. Uh, the coastline that we are working is exactly almost all part is the touristical size. We have thousands, five stars, four stars, three stars hotels at the coastline and many other touristical infrastructure already settled. Uh, from 2010 to 2020, we have found more than 300 shipwrecks uh, in these coastlines. And almost 90% of the shipwrecks are very close to the coastline. It's not the open water, it's just about 30, 40, 50 meters far from the coastline. Okay, for example, at the coast of Antalya last year, we have found 40, uh, 42 wrecks, mainly the Roman wrecks, but we have found also the Iron Age wrecks and Ottoman wrecks, such as this wreck. Okay, and at the Mersin coastline, we have found 12 wrecks. They are in mainly 4th or 5th uh, century AD wrecks. And uh, the cargo of the wrecks are mainly amphora or plates. Uh, we have uh, several excavations at the coastline, and all the excavations are just, sorry, two of the excavations are just 50, 60 meters far from the coastline, and one of them is on the touristical um, seaway. For example, this shipwreck is uh, 11th century tableware shipwrecks, and we have already collected about 200 full part of the plates from the wreck. It is uh, carried out by Akdeniz University, Antalya Museum, and uh, 9 uh, September in Dokuzel University. Another excavation of us is another Ottoman uh, trade wreck, and the main cargo of the wreck is bronze and copper um, kitchen wares. And we have already collected many uh, uh, remains, and they are at Alanya Museum uh, uh, waiting for restoration and conservation process. And another excavation of us is again just 30, 40 kilometers, 40 meters far from the coastline, 
is a Bronze Age a copper uh, shipwreck. Uh, we are working on this uh, shipwreck with Antalya Museum as Akdeniz University and INA. And this is probably the oldest trade wreck of the world. Okay, let's talk on the subject again. Uh, uh, you see a sunken site. This is, as you said, this is just connected to the um, coastline. And the main uh, deep of the site is just one, two, three meters. We know this place because here is a touristical uh, site. The name of the site is Kekova. And uh, here is in the protection area of the uh, Antalya region. Another example at the coastline construction is at the Mersin, the east part of the Turkish Mediterranean, uh, uh, on an island named Dana Island. We have about 300 rock cut slipways, uh, and some part of the slipways are uh, covered by the sea water, and some part are at, on the coastline. Okay, another examples are coming from different part of Turkey. In Marmara Sea, very close to um, Istanbul, there is another island named Avşa Island. And uh, just the coastline of the Avşa Island, uh, there are some late Neolithic and uh, Bronze Age uh, uh, settlements in the water, co covered by the seawater, but of course, these are under the water in this moment, just because of Holocene, Holocene sea level rising. Another example at Dardanel, very close to Çanakkale, at the north part of Turkey. Uh, there is another Neolithic site, partly submerged and partly on the, on the coastline. Another example is coming from Istanbul at Beylikdüzü. Uh, the site is the uh, name of the site is Angurina, and uh, some part of the site is already covered by the seawater just because of the erosion of the seawater and the wind. Uh, and some part is under the vegetation or under the earth. As you see, there are many, many uh, sunken or partly sunken sites, not only the shipwrecks, but archaeological sites, uh, uh, mainly Neolithic or Bronze Age coastal sites of Turkish coast, is partly or completely covered by the seawater in this moment because of sea level rising or because of earthquakes. And of course, uh, shipwrecks are also our subject. Okay, this example is coming from Monaco. Uh, in 1955, the place was just a very beautiful beach, but uh, about uh, 44 years later, uh, this place is filled and uh, in touristical um, sites, site and harbor is built on the filling site. These are very new, famous, uh, uh, man-made islands at Dubai. 2001, there were no islands, but 2019, uh, we see uh, islands on the water. Another one is Dalian. Uh, as you see, there are very big uh, uh, construction on the sea, but at past, you couldn't see any construction. The question is, before the filling, I'm wondering that did really check on the water cultural heritage at the coastline or not? This is an important question mark. And unfortunately, many of the uh, countries, even if they are three, uh, uh, poor countries or rich and modern countries, it doesn't matter in this moment, they are almost equal. The men of the government do not start to underwater archaeology survey before the constructions, before the filling the sites. Okay, not only the, 
costal feelings, but other, other affections on touristical sites, for example, harbor deepenings. There are many harbors are cleaning because of the uh, uh, natural feeling to the harbors. But of course, when they are cleaning, they don't check to underwater archaeological objects. Another one is the pipeline constructions. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different type of pipeline con con constructions, not only natural gas or petrol, but also the water. Uh, uh, they, are, they are excavating to the deep with them some special uh, jet slats, but of course, no one has underwater archaeology or who has some idea on underwater archaeology working with jet slats uh, during the construction works. And it means that thousands of kilometers pipeline constructions, unfortunately, couldn't check from the angle of archaeology. And uh, uh, don't think that these pipelines are very tiny, very small. There are many heavy part of the uh, pipeline constructions already settled or settling to the deep of the sea. And another one is also related to tourism infrastructure. These kind of constructions are uh, 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 happening everywhere of the world. Of course, the fishing is, uh, is a human need, but this is also part of the tourism. Uh, uh, you know, these traveling methods are using almost everywhere. There are some regulations uh, against the traveling, but unfortunately, we couldn't check probably enough, and uh, we know that uh, none of the fishermen crew uh, did check too deep before the traveling methods. It means that they are destroying every year hundreds shipwrecks uh, in the deep, everywhere of the world. And the sea accidents, uh, uh, you know, we have some special places like ship traps. Uh, if a ship sunk because of this ship trap, unfeasible uh, rocks on the coastline uh, 2,000 years ago, same uh, ship trap also affect another ship 1,000 years later. And uh, this uh, uh, process is happening uh, many times, repeating many times. And when we find a modern shipwreck, in Turkey, definitely we found another, uh, at least one or two ancient shipwrecks under the modern wreck during this, uh, this kind of places. Another important factor uh, uh, which destroyed the underwater cultural heritage is the anchoring. You know, the captains never looked to the deep when they sent their anchor. And of course, if a captain during the storm we should escape some um, shelter uh, when they go from somewhere to another place. Uh, this place is also have been used by another captain 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And some of the wrecks, uh, some of the ships already sunk at the same places. And now we are destroying with very heavy anchors uh, uh, present times, and prison divers on the wrecks. Uh, uh, these are just some of the factors which are related to the prison and underwater cultural heritage. Uh, and divers also another factor. Of course, I am not saying that all divers are creating some dangers on the wrecks. I know at least 90% of them are very respectful to protection of underwater cultural heritage, but what about 10%? This is important. And unfortunately, uh, some of the divers, even they are tourists or not, are uh, consciously or unconsciously destroying to the um, archaeology objects when they dive to the water. Possible solutions, of course, education, awareness, love and regulations. Okay, when we are talking on the education, of course, uh, as you know, we have established UNESCO Unity Underwater Archaeology Network, 
and we are organizing um, underwater archaeology workshops for the uh, government's officers. And we did twice in Turkey. And in other parts of the world, there are also uh, several uh, uh, workshops on the subjects, including Africa or um, Asia. In Turkey, um, actually, I'm very really proud to say that since um, 1880s, during the Ottoman period, uh, the law, which is written by Osman Hande Bey, uh, is also the established founder of the Turkish um, Istanbul Museum. Uh, they add protection uh, uh, regulations for underwater cultural heritage uh, at the border of the Ottoman Empire. And same regulations also transfer to Turkish uh, uh, protection regulations. But still now, not only in Turkey, but in the many of the other countries uh, need to protect in the uh, uh, to the underwater cultural heritage in the legal frame. I know, and as many of you already know, that unfortunately many countries, including the rich and big countries, didn't protect the underwater cultural heritage enough, and uh, the awareness also necessary for the uh, uh, governmental uh, officers. And this one is actually one of our program, which it happened at Paris in the center of UNESCO related to um, underwater cultural heritage uh, uh, programs in Turkey. Okay, when we start to talk on awareness, we also have to start to, with the children. We are organizing uh, children awareness program in Turkey every year in the frame of International Camel Underwater Days. And uh, uh, when we talk on the protection, actually, we have to start from the diving instructors. And we wrote a book on the subject name Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. And in Turkey now, I can say that all two stars divers have to take a course on how to protect underwater cultural heritage from their diving instructors. This is a must for all two stars divers, and we are um, educate to diving instructors in Turkey. Until now, 400 CMAS diving instructors already have this training program. And now this training program in a form uh, reflect the CMAS. Uh, we are working on the subject with Emad and our other colleagues from UNESCO Unity in Underwater Archaeology Network. And the protection approaches already reflect the um, CIMA Scientific Committee. Uh, uh, we are working on the subject to as uh, CIMAS. Okay. It is widely recognized that underwater cultural uh, archaeological vol volumes are uh, beneath the surface of seas and lakes. And these are all fragile, and these are all uh, have to protect, uh, and these are all uh, have to uh, 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 come until the future generations. Okay, this is the end of my presentations, and thanks to all who listen us. Thank you very much, Hakan, for also a fantastic presentation with all the activities that you are doing in Turkey and all the different challenges that uh, tourism is posing to heritage preservation. I will start maybe the five, six minutes uh, time for questions that we had by asking you, Hakan, one question, especially regarding, I mean, this period of pandemia that we are having, obviously, uh, tourism has decreased in probably all the world, all the planet. So from one side, how this has affected the tourism industry, uh, meaning also how investing on heritage, I mean, visits to sites, etc. if that existed. And on the other side, how this has somehow prevented damage from happening during the last year, specifically in Turkey. I don't know if you had some information on that, if you managed to do some surveys or some fieldwork in the last summer, or if you can tell us a bit, uh, reflect on that mainly. 
Um, actually, uh, during the last summer, it was the high season also for pandemic. We have created, we have actually catch the opportunity from the cries. And you know, we have a ship and our crew is about 18. Uh, uh, by our ship, we just go to the Turkish coastline for underwater surveys and only one in a week approach the coastline and we created our own um, um, protection. And this is actually uh, uh, very beneficial for us. Uh, this is why we have found many shipwrecks than the usual time. Uh, and from other sides, uh, the pandemic also affected tourism, and it means that less trees and probably more clean waters in Turkey and visibility also was very really good. Thank you, Hakan. Uh... So now we, we open for questions. I mean, if people have uh, any questions, you can raise the hand, so put it on the chat. Anybody? I'm looking attentively the chat. Doesn't I look have, like. Um, I, I have sent uh, on the chat the links to the documentaries and uh, to the Lebanon uh, project on the Perfect. HF. Thank you. Um, so everybody can see the links on the chat. Someone raise their hands. Richa and Diana Balabamo Jefa. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi. So, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, I'm from, uh, I come from Madagascar. And uh, I have a question for uh, about the second presentation. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, what are practical strategies to involve uh, local communities of uh, developing country to protect shipwrecks, knowing that uh, there are no material and uh, financial resources? Okay, thank you very much. And it is very important and very nice question, uh, Richard. Um, in this way, we are um, collaborating with the, um, the Turkish Underwater Sports Federation. And the president of our Turkish Underwater Federations are all academicians and they are very aware to the uh, necessity of the protection of underwater cultural heritage. You know, Turkey has about 8,500 kilometers coastline. And almost all the coastline is full of the archaeological ob objects needs to protection. And uh, the first, we need to go and convince them. Actually, we didn't uh, force ourselves to convince because they already convinced on the subject. They understood the necessities. And then we went to Ministry of Culture. And they are also very open and understood the reason why uh, to protect for underwater cultural heritage. And after the convincing to the Minister of Culture and the, the Federation of Underwater Sports at Turkey, we just collaborated with UNESCO. We have a very nice uh, friend uh, 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 in UNESCO, um, Dr. Ulike Garan. Uh, she only, um, also wrote uh, a foreword of the book. Uh, then with about um, 11 professors on underwater cultural heritage, wrote the book and uh, one sponsor uh, print um, all the book and then we could have chance to give all the books without any fee. And in the program of Turkish Underwater Federation, we are uh, training to diving instructors free of charge and diving instructors also train their students free of charge. Turkish federations also give their certification free of charge so everything is actually very nice and the people understood the necessities. And moreover, Turkish regulations, there are some rules. If you find some objects, for example, you mustn't touch them and you have to inform in three days to the government. Otherwise, it will be something like crime. And then because of this, we also tried, we also have more inform information from the divers because Divers start to uh, give some information on underwater archaeological sites 
to the government and also to us, then first we are creating, we already create the awareness or creating the awareness. And then we also start the um, collection of the information. So this is actually after the convincing of several governmental institutions, it works perfectly. Is it the answer, enough answer for your question, Richard? Yes. And uh, can I um, ask a uh, second question, please? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay. And uh, how to push or, or how to create a lobby for uh, endangered uh, underwater heritage and to achieve legislation at the uh, political and state level, for example, national assembly or ministries with a few means that uh, we have. Um, thank you. Um, actually, in Turkey, uh, uh, we don't force ourselves on the subject. It is actually kind of tradition. We are protecting underwater cultural heritage since about 230 years by the by the um, regulations, by the law. Uh, and when we go to any governmental institutions, the door were always open to us. I, I mean, we don't force ourselves, but just it is not just because of us, it is just because of the tradition of the protection of the country. So it needs some time, slowly, slowly, uh, the first, of course, you have to establish your, you have to fund your institutions. It is our chance that we have a department in university, we have a division in university, we have a research center in the university, you have an academic career. So the academic career is also very important, you know. If you are not archeologist, I mean, if you are just diver or if you are engineer, for example, um, uh, uh, Convincing to people is quite hard, but if you only educate the subject, I mean, if you educate the person on underwater culture or cultural heritage, so it means that you have all of the, a background. With your background, when you go to the governmental institution, all things will be quite easy for you and for all the people. So the education is also a very important factor on the subject. Thank you, Hakan. I think we have one last question and we put an end to today's session. So there is a question in the chat for Hakan too. Um, do you know something about the new cruise port of Turkey? Have they found something there or and does the marine traffic in the area affect, affect any potential underwater heritage? Um, actually, I understood the question, but I didn't understand ah, the new cruise port of Turkey. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, okay. sorry to butt in. Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm asking this um, because I come from the cruise line industry and I have been recently to a cruise trade in Miami and they are um, advertising this cruise port in, um, in Turkey. I don't remember offhand where it is, <laughs> but I believe it goes... It falls under the criteria where you are speaking about. I'm not sure though. Um, but anyway, the my my concern is about the cruise lines, of course. How can they protect uh, underwater heritage, especially when it comes to cruise line and destination planning? Um, actually, um, you know, Rachel, uh, Turkey has uh, 8,500 kilometers coastlines, and we have thousands ports, new cruise port. I actually know about six, seven different cruise ports. And is, is in Istanbul or some other cities? Do you have any idea? I'm not sure, but I, they're planning something close. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to look this up actually. Um, um, actually, you can easily find my email address and you can ask and I can give all information. Uh, uh, as I said, if I understood the correct site and I can give the correct answer to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Richard. 
So any any of the questions can be also sent. You can go to the iCoot website. You can send it by email to Dr. Hakan or to the email uh, that you can see there. Uh, and we can try to forward the emails to the different speakers too. So uh, if there is not any other urgent question, no one is raising the hand. So there is one new message. Okay, no, thanks. Okay, people are very happy with all the presentations. So I thank you both, Lucy and Hakan, for these fantastic thank presentations. You. I think it's been a great start for the webinar chain of iCoach this year. Uh, I recall everybody that you can follow all the news of iCoach in our Facebook page and our Twitter page. I invite you to follow them uh, there. You see the announcements for the new, the next webinars that will be happening during the next months there and all the different events. So the next webinar will be on February 18th at the same time. Uh, and it will be in charge Marc-André Verniert and it will be on shipwrecks in Arctic environments. So I thank you all for being here, all the over 100 viewers that we've been having. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week, uh, next month. Thank you. Um, um, may I say something? Yes, uh, of course. If you, have a, if you have a common webinar with Lucy, I will be first and Lucy will be second. Because when I speak after Lucy, I will be more boring. Uh, oh, and thank no, you very much all. again for all. The not at all, not at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this, uh, uh, this webinar is perfect. And thank you, Lucy, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you to thank all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks a lot. Thanks. OK. Have, thank a, a, have a good day. Good have a nice Bye. rest of the day, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wim. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.